Cool. Thank you, Tom. Uh, really happy to be here. Um, so this talk is going to be an optimistic view on decentralization. Um, like Tom said, we work on uh, infrastructure. Um, Pocket Network is the is kind of like a middleware layer that sits in between a developer and the blockchain that they're trying to access. And traditionally, if you uh, access an API um, as a developer building an app, you hit the same API every single time, whether it's your own API or a third party. Like um, you know, there's plenty of third party uh, APIs out there. Um, we are a decentralized version of this. So when your app connects and your user uh, opens up the app, it actually connects to a different node in our network every single time, or a different API. So we've got a pretty uh, unique view of infrastructure in the space. So I kind of wanted to talk about uh, some trends that uh, I'm seeing here uh, uh, in terms of the overall blockchain space. So first, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, for those of you who know me, I shill Tampa pretty hard. Um, I was born in the Caribbean, but raised in Tampa, Florida. Um, as an iOS developer, studied history in college, and taught myself to code. And I work out of a blockchain co-work space in Tampa called Blockspaces. So if you're ever in Tampa, let me know. I'd love to show you around. Um, so first off, let's take a step back. Um, for those of you who know, uh, who you know, ever you know, heard about things in the 90s, um, it was really expensive to run a startup in the 90s. Uh, you had to spend uh, millions of dollars on servers to be able to run your business. Um, before the Reddit hug of death, there was I don't know what it was called back then, but maybe the blue screen of death or something like that. But um, it was expensive. You had to buy on-site, on-premise servers to run your website, right? And if you didn't uh, have enough, then your site would crash and you'd have to buy more servers. Uh, then the cloud came. Um, Amazon Web Services uh, was invented. Um, they primarily built it to service their e-commerce site um, and were the first ones for quite some time. So that's why they have such a large market share today. But uh, all of a sudden, it became a lot easier <laughs> to build stuff. Right? I didn't have to spend millions of dollars on infrastructure. Uh, I just had to uh, use a uh, freemium service like with AWS, right? Um, the challenge is, is you know, these services, they, uh, once you get locked in, uh, they get expensive quite quickly. Um, and just to give you an idea of what the market looks like today, um, AWS owns about over 40% of the market. Uh, Azure is actually the second largest. Uh, uh, Google GCP is the third, and uh, IBM is there as well. And uh, yeah, so, so these four companies own most of the market, uh, which is quite interesting. And uh, it's growing. <laughs> so um, all these companies that just IPO'd in their S1s, you could actually see how much money they spend on these companies. Um, so uh, uh, as you can see, Snap has been spent two, it's, it's spending two billion uh, uh, with a contract, right? So. Um, it's massive, and it's like this, uh, their control of this market is growing even faster, actually. And it kind of puts yourself to wonder, like, how do we stop this uh, when the entire internet runs on like four companies? Um, that, that's a problem. <laughs> and I mean, you see all the time, like Cloudflare went down, AWS goes down, you know, a couple years ago, someone fat fingered, supposedly, uh, I think an S3 uh, uh, in Virginia, the, the, the region in Virginia, and just couldn't see any images <laughs> for the entire day, right? Um, so when, when the entire internet runs on these companies, you can effectively think of it like a tax. Um, Chamath Palihapitiya, uh, he's a pretty famous investor. Um, he basically talks about these monopolies in such a way where if I'm going to invest in a company, uh, why not invest in a company that's a tax on the entire internet, right? We all need servers, we all need infrastructure, and these guys form a really critical piece in, in what we're building. And to be honest, I mean, they really shortened and cheapened the, the cost of building startups and building companies and all these things. Uh, but now they're massive and uh, quite literally, you know, they're attacks. And for those of you who have run infrastructure, um, they seem cheap at the beginning, but they get really expensive really fast at scale, as you can see. Uh, so how do we compete? Um, like I said, I want to talk about uh, three trends uh, that I'm seeing uh, that are all directly related to the blockchain um, as a result of you know, Bitcoin being invented about 10 years ago. Right? Um, the first one is increased opportunity and incentives for consumers to run servers. What do I mean by that? Um, these are protocols that pay you to run servers, whether it's out of your home or a co-location data center. Um, literally, you're just running a server and you're getting paid for it, right? Um, that's pretty cool. And we're starting to see these economic models uh, mature. Um, I want to compare it to Bitcoin, uh, where a uh, Bitcoin caused, how many people here have like know of a Bitcoin mining farm in their home? Where they live, like have seen or heard of people running like a massive mining farm, 
where you live, right? Like I live in Tampa, Florida. It's super hot and inefficient, but there's like massive mining farms there that I've seen and visited, right? Um, Bitcoin caused this catalyst, was a catalyst of this, uh, uh, people building these data centers, mining Bitcoin. Um, I think this is a, a third generation uh, set of blockchains, uh, ours included, uh, that are incentivizing people to run servers. And I think these trends are actually uh, uh, quite positive, even though they're the very, very early part of this. Um, the other one, uh, hardware uh, uh, is getting easier to use. Uh, if you've heard of a coin mine or a DAP node, um, it's just a box that you purchase, and it's like a, it's like a Wi-Fi router almost, right? Um, coin mine looks like a like a, like an Xbox, right? They have an app. Like, it's like an Eero if you've ever heard of Eero, right? And it's quite easy, right? And um, you know when when these servers can download the software of these protocols, all of a sudden you've got this server that's making you money, right? Uh, that my mom could even use. Right. Um, the second one, uh, increased competition from smaller generalized mining server farms specialized in open source networks. Uh, what do I mean by this? Um, you've got these staking as a service providers that uh, are providing an important critical piece of these proof of stake networks. And all of these servers, all these guys, run on co-location data centers um, because it's cheaper over the long run. Uh, that's why they don't run on AWS, they don't run on GCP. Uh, very much how Bitcoin miners uh, built their own data centers, uh, these guys are running out of data centers as well. And as the economic models of these protocols mature, uh, I think we're going to start seeing more and more of this, uh, especially as you do the cost-benefit analysis of running infrastructure, right? And uh, the third trend, um, increasing efficiencies for censorship-resistant global coordination. Uh, what do I mean by this? Um, proof of work, you got the entire world to coordinate by using a lot of electricity. Uh, proof of stake is arguably more efficient, depending on who you speak to. but. Um, in terms of electricity, uh, uh, proof of stake uh, is no longer, you know, you're not using a bunch of electricity, you are staking whatever cryptocurrency it is. And I want to point out uh, generalized mining, which I think is even more efficient. Uh, if you've ever read Jake Brookman, uh, some of his blog posts on this. Um, whereas in proof of stake, you get some static block reward for protecting the network. In generalized mining, you're actually getting paid for the work that you're doing. So it's actually more efficiently accounted for. Uh, which I think is interesting. And you've got these also these all uh, these other protocols like Ava and Polkadot. Um, they both prioritize light clients. So Ava, uh, the idea is that the consensus uh, can be run on your cell phone, right? And uh, Polkadot, uh, they've uh, they're in the process of designing a light client that uh, can self-validate. So the light client uh, takes headers from an untrusted source, and actually that light client can validate whether. Uh, the data that they're receiving or the blockchain information that they're receiving is legit, right? And again, you're just running a light client is running a server on your phone, right? And I just want to talk about Pocket for a minute. Um, it's really fundamentally a protocol that incentivizes people to run full nodes. Uh, full nodes are important. Uh, one, for keeping uh, uh, the state of the blockchain honest, meaning you could have a cartel of miners or uh, proof of stake nodes uh, basically lie. If you don't have enough full, uh, full nodes protecting that, right? Also, you know, it's a database, right? So why not make this more efficient? Um, that's why we're seeing a whole bunch of really cool protocols in the caching layer, like the graph and, and Fluence and things like that. Um, but fundamentally, we are a uh, protocol that incentivizes people to run full nodes. Uh, just a quick overview of like, we launched five months ago, which was really exciting. Uh, Portis was one of the first people to actually uh, implement Pocket, which is really exciting. Um, but fundamentally, you connect a random, you connect to a random node in a network every single time, where you, if you're using MetaMask, you uh, uh, would connect to Infura every single time. If you use Pocket, you actually connect to a random node, and in fact, we're working on DAP node today, so you could potentially plug in a DAP node in your home and be a mini Infura, quite literally, which is really cool. Um, and we're blockchain agnostic, so we're our own blockchain, so we're actually running on Tendermint and uh, using Cosmos SDK. Uh, doing some modifications to it, but really what they've built is really cool. So uh, effectively, you know, the, the, the money you make in Pocket is each API request that you serve to developers. And so it looks like today. So there's a trusted uh, dispatch node, which is effectively the, the router, and we make that connection and you talk to that node until you disconnect. Uh, when we launch uh, early next year, uh, uh, at, one, at this point anyone can be a dispatch node and uh, it's fundamentally permissionless, so as long as you have the requisite pocket to participate, uh, then you will uh, you can participate as a mini infura yourself or as a mini infrastructure. And we're super excited about this because we think some really cool things can be built on top of this. 
uh, uh, and provide some other opportunities for other blockchains like uh, Cosmos, for example, where uh, it's very top heavy, the rewards. And if you can provide another incentive for these validators that are already running full nodes, well, you could actually help improve the margins of these nodes, which is really exciting. Um, there are some really hard problems that haven't been solved yet uh, that uh, uh, I think we're at just the tip of the iceberg for this stuff. Um, if you think about Amazon, um, they've spent probably billions of dollars on hardware research, on passing data, uh, in terms of bandwidth, uh, networking, things like that. Um, there are some questions as to how far this is in scale, uh, right? Where you've got a bunch of independent data centers all around the world. How do you manage the networking for that? How do you manage the bandwidth that goes in between all this information uh, at scale, right? Um, you hear data availability a lot in this blockchain space. Um, we feel like fundamentally we're helping solve that problem because you're running a full node. And if you're running a full node, it's a database and it's available, right? And hardware, uh, I think hardware is really, really important because Amazon has designed this in such a way where their hardware is very specific and very optimized for what they're doing, right? Now, how do you flip that around and do that for an open source world, right? Like we're, you know, they've spent God knows how much money, right? We're, there's no, almost no investment in this space, and I think there's a massive uh, opportunity for that as well. Um, and uh, I just want to leave with this comment. Um, if you're familiar with this quote, um, I think these trends are providing a competing narrative to software is eating the world by Andreessen Horowitz. Um, software implies trust in the people hosting those servers, and this uh, uh, actually, I think, is a reversal in that trend where people are running their own servers, right? So, yeah, it's quite exciting. And thank you. Any questions? Anything? You know, you mentioned that you're uh, launching um, Codify soon. Uh, so, what is there that we can play with today? Yeah, so we have our what we call minimum viable pocket or MVP uh, that launched like five months ago. Um, the only difference is that uh, the infrastructure providers are vetted by us, um, and we're the only dispatcher. So if you actually do like an inspect JavaScript on um, one of the apps using Pocket, you'll see that it's hitting a random node in our network every single time. Um, so yeah, it's like it's live today, right? There's just no cryptoeconomic incentive or anything like that. So I can't make any other pop up. Not today. That's only when we launch. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Code complete for the first testnet. Uh, our data is December 31st. Um, and then we'll probably do an incentivized testnet sometime after that, or right after that. So but yeah, it's live today. So you can actually, I mean, it's pretty cool. We've got over 10 nodes running. So, I um, mean, these are like professionals, uh, like awesome people like NodeSmith and QuickNode and uh, Protofire and uh, MetaCartel's even running a node. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, you know, anyone can run one. You just have to kind of show us that you can run decent infrastructure because we don't want this crashing in this early stage, right? Once there's a financial incentive, uh, uh, things change. So. What, what's my minimum steps? Yeah, so our core client is really thin. It's like tiny. It really depends on the blockchain that you're running, right? So if you're running Ethereum, um, your specs are going to be a little bit larger or, you know, a little bit more intensive than, I don't know, uh, uh, Bitcoin or something. Or maybe not Bitcoin, but uh, Litecoin or whatever, right? So it really depends on the blockchain that you're running because you're running Pocket Core, which is just a thin layer on top of it or in front of it, and it just relays a system or relays uh, RPC calls and just wraps them up. And that's, that's really it. So I'm not actually running it. Sorry. No, it's okay. I'm not actually uh, running. I'm not actually uh, RPC. I'm just a relay between, uh, between these Correct. So like someone who's using Portis, for example, uh, like an app that's using Portis, uh, uh, you know, their users log in that's using Pocket and Portis. Uh, they're making the RPC calls. We just wrap it up with our SDK, and that gets sent into our network, which allows it to be relayed. So it's actually a quite thin layer that, that enables that to happen. Cool. Anything else? Yeah. Cool. Thank you, everyone.